three. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, as usual, we are keeping our introductions short because we're actually asking our speakers to tell us about their trajectory. But uh, nevertheless, I'm delighted and honored to introduce Professor Jean Carlson. And Jean, please take it away. Okay, well, I wanna thank the organizers for this opportunity and invitation to reflect on the history um, that brought me to this place that I am now um, in my life and in my career. Um, this first slide is actually from a talk I gave um, back in 2019 at the public lecture in Santa Fe um, from a program on aging. And so it was a public lecture. And so I did a lot of, a little bit of digging back into my own history, found a picture of myself um, as a graduate student getting my PhD. And then this is a picture of me with two of my students uh, later on. So I've been at UCSB for 33 years. And let me see, I'm not, it's not letting me there. Okay, um, there we go. So uh, yeah, I've worked on lots of different things. So more than just bio, I've been sort of one of those very broad multidisciplinary complex systems group. We've worked on neuroscience, biological systems, earthquakes. I've been the earthquake lady for 33 years, um, ecosystems, forest fires, technological systems. Um, so the thing that draws all those things together, I'm actually, you know, I'm a theory group, so we work on modeling, we work on um, data-driven methods for system identification, and things like feedback, dynamics, and control of uncertainty. So one kind of a theme for this is to think of things in terms of levels and layers. So levels would be like multi-scale, going up in scale, connecting scales, and layers is really trade-offs within a given um, layer, uh, like a transportation layer in a system or something like that. So we bring to these, these kinds of themes and perspectives to a lot of different types of systems. Robust yet fragile is one of the themes of our group where we think about how making a system robust in one way can make it fragile in other ways. Um, and I'm not going to talk about my research so much. I think maybe, maybe the history is part of the understanding the history is to understand the breadth of what has been really a, an exciting, fun, um, and opportunity to be creative with my group. So I've been working you know, throughout my career on topics that connect with real people in the real world. Um, I care about the topics. They have some connection to my life. And I've had the good fortune to work with truly fabulous multidisciplinary collaborators and learn from them about what the important issues are in their field. So you see Jim Langer here. We worked on earthquake problems together. Ralph Archuleta was the, the uh, earth scientist to explain to us everything about earthquakes. Here's Scott Grafton, who's a neuroscience uh, collaborator and so on. So there's a lot of people that I've worked with in a lot of different departments that have really taught me a lot. And I view this as just a blessing and an opportunity to learn new things from friends. Um, another important, let me see, I keep losing my thing. Okay, another obviously critical uh, piece of the puzzle is my amazing and wonderful students throughout the years. So generally they've been the glue in all my collaborations and it wouldn't be possible to do the work we've done without these people. So they've really learned how to be bilingual or trilingual um, in working with the group and they've gone off in lots of different directions. So as I mentioned, this, this is sort of opportunity to reflect is coming out of a five-year program from the McDonald Foundation, uh, which has working groups thinking about aging and adaptation, arrow of time, across a lot of different types of applications. Um, for me, this also occurred around the time that, you know, my parents, I look back at my parents' life, my father, this is my dad, this is my mom getting married, this is a, you know, more recent, obviously, picture arrow of time going in a particular obvious direction here. Um, my father passed away in 2018, and so a lot of what I was doing during some of these Santa Fe working groups was, um, you know, dealing with my parents' things and getting my mom situated in assisted living. So here I am with my mom. Here I am the last time we were in the house together um, back in Valparaiso that next uh, spring, she moved into assisted living. And that was right when I gave that public lecture. And so I had some of these old pictures of my mom, and, you know, in terms of our move. 
So one thing that was true for me, I grew up in Indiana, Valparaiso, Indiana, and my house was truly in the middle of a university campus. So this little arrow is my house and this little street was a funny little neighborhood right in the middle of campus. You know, there were athletic, you know, buildings, there was a chapel, there was an engineering building, all here. And it was like bike paths, you know, everywhere around the sidewalks. And I had, you know, my childhood was just filled with this wonderful environment of growing up on the university campus. My parents were professors and this was my playground. So here's some pictures. It's a Lutheran university. It's the largest chapel in the entire, you know, United States largest pipe organ. Um, my, my uncle and my dad used to sit in the back of church and make jokes and they would call this God's orange juice squeezer. But this was right, just right there. We would run and we would basically, there are all these hidden passages for the ministers to pop out at the right time. So I played here. This is the victory bell, which of course we climbed up and clanged. This is the, the gym that was right in my backyard. Um, and then this is where my dad taught. My dad taught math and computer science in the engineering building. And so we would go play at the time with the computers. So he took me as like a nursery school kindergarten kid and we would play uh, tic-tac-toe with the computer. And that was a hugely big deal. Um, this uh, first disk, disk storage IBM was born the year I was born. And my home, they, these card reader machines were all in that computer room and the students would hand in their homework on these punch cards. And my dad would take stacks of these and go see if their code worked. So it's just a different time for computings. And my, my dad and my mom made like Christmas tree ornaments out of these, uh, these punch cards. But um, when my mom, my mom uh, grew up in a family with four kids. And when she went to college, her parents said she had to stay close to home. So she went in Southern Indiana to DePaul University where she met my dad. Um, her two brothers went to Stanford and Princeton. So those, those restrictions were not placed on them, but they were placed on my mom. Um, they, my parents went to grad school, University of Michigan. When she was there, she got pregnant with me and she lost her fellowship. So they took that away when she got pregnant. That's what happened. That was like what it was. Um, and then women couldn't get a mortgage, they couldn't qualify for credit. So there were many uh, limitations at that time that were placed on women of my mom's generation. And so I think, you know, largely based on their experience, they raised me so that I never felt like there were limits on what I could do. I always have felt like I could go into something new and I had a lot of confidence doing it. So that, that is me and I, I was looked just like that. Um, anyway, so I did a lot of different things growing up. I did scouts and 4-H, I was an athlete. Here I am on a swim team. I was a mathlete. I did a lot of math contests, here I am. I was tall um, and then I biked and explored all over the university campus. So I sort of put this picture here. This is from this old, I don't even know if it's still there but Family Circus is a cartoon in the comic strips and they have these kids and they basically go running around all over the neighborhood and they have this thing that shows their explorations. And that's really how I grew up. I was playing all over the university campus. My first job was unit building, serving food. I, you know, I found all the secret passageways. There's a bowling alley, <laughs> things like that. Um, so, so when I went to college, I went to Princeton and I majored in electrical engineering and computer science. This is the engineering building, but I also took a lot of pure math and physics. And when I went, I just wanted to make sure I had a career that was going to make me independent, um, given the background. So I, I sort of identified engineering, but then I took my first physics class in college and I really loved it. And so I wound up uh, doing engineering physics, which is an interdisciplinary program. And it also allowed me to take a lot of pure math. So I took a lot of pure math, a lot of um, engineering, um, physics, and then I took a lot of English and creative writing. So English and creative writing made an extremely strong impression on me. And I studied for two years in small group creative writing seminars with Joyce Carol Oates. And this is exactly how I remember her. So she was just, she's an amazingly accomplished writer, if people don't know about her. She's just written in many different genres. She's, she's incredibly brilliant, but she ran these small seminars and I was lucky I was in it. And she taught me many things about writing that I think transfer to science and also transfer to writing in science. So excellent writing is in your own voice. You have to dig deep. It has to be true and genuine and sincere. Can't be made up. 
Um, it has that multi-scale architecture, right? That technical uh, thing where you have to look at it from the point of view as every word, you know, sentence, paragraph, chapter, everything counts and it has, it's constructed in a certain way. It's technically rigorous. So you don't have a lot of um, messy things and then it's heavily critiqued. So the motto of these, these classes where you leave your ego at the door and she is so sharp, but absolutely on point that you, <laughs> you would really, uh, you know, harsher than any NSF or paper critical review. So, so in comparison, my, um, my engineering and, you know, advisors, uh, Steve Lyon at Princeton and John Warlock at Bell Labs where I had summer jobs were jolly, <laughs> right? Jolly and encouraging. And I worked um, for two years on quantum condensed matter experiments, the early sort of um, heterostructure kinds of experiments. And so this is my first paper. And then when it came time to decide where to go to grad school, of course, Steve had been an undergraduate at Cornell and John had been a PhD student at Cornell. So they said, go to Cornell, you should go to Cornell. So I went to Cornell and then I became a theorist. And so they were like, where did we go wrong? And I used to always meet them at the March meeting and I would have these lunches with them. And it was really fun to see them again because they were really strong influences and very supportive of my um, you know, my progress, even though I became a theorist. Um, I was in Jim Sethna's group. So I was the first Sethna cohort. Um, he was a new pr assistant professor. And this is the people that I think of as our first cohort. So we wound up all over the place. When I was there, I actually did biophysics. So my very first research project what involved lung, lung surfactant. So it was um, Watt Webb's group was a biophysics group and applied physics there. And I worked on models for, for sort of large sort of pattern structures in lung surfactants. Um, I also worked on networks. I worked on spin glasses. That was my main thesis project. Um, those were the early predecessor to um, neural networks. There were, there were books called like Spin Glass Theory and Beyond. And then I did a final, when I finished what was basically my thesis, I did a little project on ITC because that was extremely popular. And I gave a March meeting talk at this session that was like a rock concert because it was the year ITC came out. So that's kind of my timeline. And you can see Jim's group had people that have kind of wound up in all kinds of different things. And Jim was really fun and encouraging and fearless about going into new areas. So I really had that background uh, before I came to UCSB. He also loved computers. So as an undergrad, we were working you know, with my engineering, computer science, IBM 3033, great big building. You'd submit your work to batch jobs. Um, when I was a grad student, Jim got a whole bunch of these Apple Tower computers, first generation Apple computers for a computer lab. He was so excited about it. People did figure out how to play all kinds of tricks on each other with these. And then when I came to ITP, where I was a postdoc before it was KITP, um, we got for the first time, they were getting workstations. They hadn't really been a computer place. They were kind of anti-computing, but I did, um, I, I had the Sun workstation. Um, another thing that was really nice at Cornell is that there was a reasonable number of women in physics at Cornell for the time. When I had been at Princeton, I was often the only woman in a physics, math, or engineering class. And I was also the only engineer in creative writing. And my year, uh, specifically at Cornell, there were like seven women, which was an unusual thing. When I came to UCSB, there was a first year woman, second year woman, third year woman, fourth year and fifth year woman, whereas this is not all of them. There's more than this, but there were quite a few. Um, and here I pulled the women um, out of the, the group members that have just come out of my group at UCSB. So we still have a ways to go, but they've had a lot of really amazing women students who've been amazing scientists, but also leaders in science and education, diversity, inclusion, outreach. Um, and here's some of the programs And Eric, you know, is a great example also of the men who've been extremely strong leaders too. But it, coming from my mom who, you know, was her fellowship went away when she was in grad school. Um, we have seen progress, but again, there's, there's a long way to go. Um, so at UCSB, my work is in this area, again, multidisciplinary, lots of different areas. Um, and that has involved me, you know, here I am, this is UCSB campus now, here's Broida, kind of in the middle of it. 
And then here's KITP now. And what I do is I collaborate with people all over campus. So we kind of have these multidisciplinary campus uh, activities. We run all over, we, we listen, we leave our egos at the door and we learn and listen from our colleagues. And we've done all this research. So it comes back to really this picture of universities as being amazing places. It's not just your building. It's really a whole place of learning and it's not even just science, right? There's so much to take advantage of. And one of the things that I wondered when I first came here is like, where are the kids? Like I used to play on my bike and I didn't see that at UCSB. So when I had kids, <laughs> I took them all over and we biked and we explored and did all of this. So here's my kids, my daughter and my son way back when. I'm a single mom, I have two kids. I'm an only child. So it's kind of like the buck stops here from both sides. Um, they, you know, they were fun and they, we went hiking a lot. Santa Barbara's a great place for kids and it's possible. I wouldn't necessarily recommend being a single parent but it's possible and can be a very rich and wonderful experience. Here they are older and then this is more recent. This is the Christmas before COVID with my mom and her assisted living, my two kids who are both now in grad school. And now here I am back in Santa Barbara with my dog on the beach by campus. So, um, so I'm really proud. I, I view one thing as being really my greatest accomplishment as life is, is my family. Um, another thing that I did though, in terms of kids is get heavily involved in outreach. And this really started back when uh, my kids were young. So they were two and six. So I started something called Physics Circus, which is still in place now. Um, it started with someone, um, Abigail Reed, now Mecklenburg, who um, at the time was a graduate student in education at UCSB. Since then, she got a PhD in applied physics and she's a professor at Notre Dame. So she's, she's still there and around and this program is still active and super fun. And here's my son who was an undergrad at UCSB. He's a grad student at Caltech, but um, you can see that, that uh, we do this and we do it and we developed an online version of this in the last year, which was really fun too. So I'll end there, but I just encourage everyone to have really to have fun. I mean, it's really important to have fun with what you're doing. Don't, you know, don't be fearful, be fearless and enjoy the people that you work with. One of the really important things is you got to like your collaborators. Don't collaborate with somebody who you don't like because that, that will be miserable. But if you like your collaborators, wonderful. And of course, my students have kept things wonderful through me, for me, even in, during times of my life, which were really hard and stressful. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I'm clap clapping in. Uh, for everybody. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand or just um, just unmute yourself and go. Uh, team has a question. Uh, but you're muted, Team. Nice to meet you and hear about your career and life. Um, you seem to be a together person and strong in your choices, do you see a contribution from your early life for that independence or in your career as you've gone along? Because I would presume you have powered yourself through most of this. I mean, I do think I grew up as a very independent um, only child. I grew up in a small town, you know, during, during a time when I could do everything and I did. So it's a, it's a you know, harder time now, I think, for young kids who are way more worried about building a portfolio for college, right? I had my first job when I was very young, uh, 12 or something. I was tutoring and teaching swimming lessons at 14. I worked in food service at the university. And, um, and I always, you know, I took classes at the university before going to college. Um, there were times in my life that it was kind of sink or swim. So when I went to Princeton, I jumped into like all these really hard classes because I'd never felt really that challenged in high school. And so here I was with all these people that had come from elite prep schools. <laughs> and I would say that transition was a little bit sink or swim and I swam, but it wasn't without, you know, some bumps and making choices at the time. So I think, I think sometimes you go through hard things and you realize you know, what's important and you focus on those. 
So I think one of the things I also felt was that when I found myself as a single mom with two kids who were not, you know, had aspects of their lives that were not easy children, um, I, I really decided that, you know, work had to be, had to be joyful. I couldn't bring stress home with me because that would be bad. And, um, and I wound up the re being strategic about what I did. I would do the things that required me to do it. So physics circus was one of those things. Um, I also really have found that I've had um, amazing students who like, I would, I would go home and I would have my kids melting down in a very severe way and then come back to work and, and my students would have made like progress. <laughs> and it was just so wonderful to go in and have that. So I, I have a lot of belief in the younger generation and I, and I didn't always bang my head against some of the things that were just, you know, kind of immobile in my career life. So I, I've had, um, I feel that being a professor is one of the things that can be very flexible for people. It's not like being a doctor or a lawyer where your workday is um, constrained by, I have to be, do the surgery or I have to be in court at this time. I, I'm a theorist, so I could work from home. I never missed my kids um, school things. I never missed a performance or a doctor's appointment or a swim meet for my kids. Um, I had to be their advocates for some pretty serious issues along the way. And somehow, you know, by being a scientist, uh, the timelines are not like you have to get this done by, by the, tomorrow, right? There's the timelines and the reward system is on a longer time scale and, um, and it rewards ideas. So rewarding ideas, you can have ideas, <laughs> you know, and, and figure out what they are and great collaborations with, you know, even if with your collaborators, you're screaming kids in the background. It's a, it's a pretty friendly uh, career if you view it that way. If you view it with stress, if you feel like people are constantly judging you, then that's, that's no good. So you have to choose a way to surround yourself with people who really want the best for you. And I think I did that. Well, I acknowledge how difficult what you've done seems to me as I look at it, and I hope it's been rewarding. And thank yeah, you it for has. everything. Yeah. yeah, it has. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And a few more people have their hands raised. Uh, Rana and then Shri. Hi, Jean. Really nice talk. Thank you. Uh, you touch upon something that is uh, uh, a little off a touchy topic, but you presented it with so much hope and positiveness, which is how much progress has been made in the community in terms of women contributions to science and what can be done. Uh, but I think we're still really, really far from an equitable environment. Yeah. Uh, so my question to you is, what is your advice to women or people from marginalized groups who still face patronizing behavior and intimidation and harassment on a daily basis and how to deal with that. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that um, one, of the, one of the really nice things about having been in, in such a multidisciplinary community throughout my career is that, that certain fields have this more toxic um, culture than others. And you can just see it when you go to a meeting and how, you know, first of all, what's the comp composition of the, you know, speakers and panels and, um, and then how are the speakers treated, you know, when they're asking questions and things like that. So I think that, that, that for me, it was eye-opening to see how different it could be in different fields. Um, and I do think it's important to, to surround yourself, you know, and have mentors that have this positive point of view that want the best for you. Because if all you're banging your head against is this really sort of toxic environment, it's horrible. And it's really hard when you get in it to get out of it and it can drain you. <laughs> so I know, you know, I have a little bit of, you know, that kind of experience. One of the things that is remarkable to me is actually how much better um, American Physical Society is now, you know, than when I was a grad student, um, when there was no DBIO or DSOFT. And, and I see so many women, more women in positions of leadership. Um, and I think that is, you know, these conversations are happening 
And, I, and I'm really um, hopeful about that. So I would just say when, you're, when, you, when you are confronted with that, find a supportive group. When I was a grad student, we had this larger cohort of women grad students. So we had a women in physics group and you know, there would even be things where we would talk to you know, confidentially to you know, students about experiences with advisors and things like that. And there, that was kind of known you know, who, who was doing what and who not to work with <laughs> you know, for as, as difficult as that is, but it is something that is it's a true thing. And I think it really is important to um, you know, verbalize it and to find, um, find groups. But I'm just, you know, I, I am so pleased with it. I hadn't been to a March meeting for a long time and then I've been to you know, one or two recently. I'm like, wow, this has really changed. And I, and I love seeing people you know, such as our leaders here, but you know, also people from my group that have been, you know, been getting involved in, in physics and, you know, the broader diversity and inclusion issues. So it's, it's much more of a matter of discussion now and hopeful. And I also feel like when I look at my students, um, their, their relationships are good. So my students, you know, have gotten married and they, they have kids and they are partners in this process and, and it seems to be, you know, really healthy and supportive, kind of happy relationships. Whereas, <laughs> you know, my my situation didn't wind up that way. So I, I think that's a great a great thing to see too. So, thank you. Okay, and uh, Shri, go ahead. Uh, you have your hand. Uh, thanks, Arit. I'll try to keep it uh, short and sweet. Uh, Jean, thank you so much for such an uplifting talk. Um, I wanted to uh, bring up the fact that Val Valparaiso, of course, is so close to Indiana Dunes, right? Yes. And yeah. uh, you are now in the university which has its own lagoon, is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so does this proximity to beach have something to do with <laughs> joy and fearlessness? Um, yeah, so we rode bikes, right? When I was a kid, we're 10 miles straight down from the tip of Lake Michigan, which comes down and on one side you have Chicago and then Indiana and then up into Michigan. And so we, we, my friends and I, we would ride about 10 miles up to the beach and explore. And, and I was, you know, hiking there, it's beautiful. I think when I first came to Santa Barbara, I was like, or even went east to college, I wondered where the dunes were because my sense of, of going to the beach was so ecological, so rich. And there was like this long distance between, you know, what it was to park and where it was to actually get to the beach. Um, I think getting and hiking um, and, and being happy <laughs> is a really big important thing in there. And actually a remarkable number of my friends and people that I rode bikes to the dunes with have all, you know, wound up as scientists and, um, you know, getting PhDs. One of them at NIST, who is like my very close friend. Another one is out doing, we live just down the block, is, does this sort of um, wildlife preservation. So another one does like business economics. So from a small town and a small class, it's, you know, maybe because a lot of us had parents who were affiliated with the university, but, but we did explore and there was a lot of encouragement to do so. And, and here in Santa Barbara, we have that all around us. And it's a great place for um, Santa Barbara's always been a great place for interdisciplinary work um, and much, a lot of great place for marine science and ecological sciences. Eric got his you know, PhD working very closely also with one of our theoretical ecologists here. So, um, so it, it's, it's really rich with a kind of blend of your experiences. You have to get out of your office, right? It's just too pretty. You get out of your office, you go for walks, you think, and then you have ideas. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean, and thank you all for your uh, discussion questions. I think even the time uh, we.